Um, and we're here at the neighbor house. Who's, who's the first time uh, at the neighbor house? Well Look at that. Well, yeah, <coughs> wow, Rick, Rick Rice. Okay, Rick, you gotta get out of Wyzetta, Rick. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I bet your GPS didn't even work coming over here. <laughs> yeah, so what's St. Paul, what? Yeah, I know, I know it didn't work. But, but the idea is that, you know, in 22 years we started out at all the hotels downtown Minneapolis. In fact, our favorite hotel was the, uh, was the Minneapolis Hilton. And, and, it, it, and we gave them a, a multicultural award because you go into their hotel, it's diverse. I mean, they have a lot of everybody there. So if you're, uh, say for instance, you're, you're from one of our African countries and you walk in and you want to do an event, you know, there's some of the people you see, you feel welcome there. And they're a number one hotel in, in our book. So we gave them an award. And, but but uh, four years ago, we decided that um, we want to start doing immersion. We want, we want our marketers to come down to the community and start feeling what the community is. And because of marketers, they need that stimulation. They want to feel that, hey, I'm over here. I was down in the, in, in the west side. This is really the home of the Latino community going back to the, to the uh, late 30s. This is where they settled here. And right below where Comcast, and you know Comcast, right below where they've got that, that big headquarters. You know, they're doing well over there, Comcast. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Sam's here, and Alexis, how about Comcast is just Sam and Alexis, hi. Hey. Glad you're here. Yeah. Glad to be here. And so, you know, th that's where they settled, the, the Latino community. And at the time, just a little history, we got just a few minutes. At the time, that was where the Jewish community had settled. Way earlier, way back in, in, in the beginning of the 1900s, so it was the Jewish community and the Latinos moved in. And uh, uh, my family, my mom and dad, who came from Mexico, they were undocumented, as many were back in the 30s. And they settled, they settled in, into uh, St. Peter, Minnesota. A farmer took them in, and uh, my mom and dad, they came here from Mexico. And then they heard about all the great jobs in South St. Paul. We got the mayor of South St. Paul, Jimmy Francis, mayor of South St. Paul. That's right, that's right, it's right down the street. Now, Jimmy, I mean, we want to talk to you because you didn't want Cesar Chavez Street going into South St. Paul, that's what I heard. So we had to stop it at your border, right? You didn't want to change. Was that, that wasn't you, right? I was elected just last year. Oh, right, okay, okay. okay. We'll let you go on that one, all right. Because we, there was a sign there, no Caesar Chavez in South St. Paul. So wait a minute, man. But but so so we, you know, the Jewish communities there. Imagine this: they had five synagogues right down in that area. So it, all the Jewish community in Minnesota would come down there on the weekends, and that's where we grew up, the Latinos, with the Jew, with the Jewish community. And what we had was shared values: family, education, you know, loved America, all that stuff, you know. And so this was the kind of the this is what's, what's left of the, uh, hi Jonah, come on in. What's left of the uh, community here. And uh, so we love it, you know, his, uh, El Burrito, just uh, for history here. El Burrito was the first supermarket in Minnesota, first Latino supermarket in Minnesota. And uh, so that's, that's a little bit of history there. And Our Lady of Guadalupe. So we're happy to be here, with, and we're happy you're here. We've got a great program today, but uh, you know, let's, let's really talk about how we, how we get these shows done in 22 years. We've had some tremendous sponsors, ladies and gentlemen. That's how we stay in business, really. And one thing I like about what we do here in Minnesota that's different than if you go to other shows of these kind in, uh, around the country. You know, we have sponsors like U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank gives us a nice, nice number every year, very nice. Got driving a new car, U.S. Bank, thank you, okay? <laughs> Very nice, but but uh, but um, they say, listen, we're gonna have, we're gonna sponsor these conferences, and we want everyone to come and learn. You know, Wells Fargo is gonna be here, TCF. We want everyone to come and learn. What a great message that a corporation. We want you all to learn about multicultural marketing because it's good for Minnesota. It's good for our economy, and that's the kind of sponsors we have. And, you know, we have some new sponsors to it. You know, uh, the, the Ordway is uh, someone we just start collaborating with. And, uh, you know, Leah, Leah Dixon's here. Leah, from the Ord Hi, Leah, Hi. from the Ordway. We love the Ordway. Uh, and if you see our newspapers, Latino American Today, we, we're doing some collaboration with them. Thank you 
for your sponsorship. I know Christina's coming soon. Another group that we started working with last year is the uh, Minnesota DNR, with States and Parks, State, State Parks and Trails. They're a, a great friend of ours, and uh, you know our, our goal with them is to get more people, more multicultural folks going to the state parks. That's one of our legacies, and, and we're committed to that. You know, Deborah's here, Deborah High, and Deborah Lott is one of, yeah. Yeah, Deborah. She just won an award for some of the multicultural outreach you're doing. Congratulations, Deborah. And so, uh, of course, uh, the Minnesota Twins, yeah. Miguel Ramos is on his way. He said he's, uh, he's in spring training, but he's, he's on the way over here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're an amazing story. We started with the Twins many years ago, and because of our relationship now, they're one of the few teams in Major League Baseball that have their own multicultural marketing department. Can you imagine? You know, half of the team's Latino, you know, yeah. right? <laughs> And, and so they got the message, and uh, we love working with the, with the twins. Um, also, we're working uh, with, a lot with uh, the Multicultural Media Consortium. They're on the way. They're out delivering their newspapers. They'll be here. And, um, and so we have a lot of, of different people here. But we want to thank, I'm going to hand for all our sponsors. Yeah. And some of our presenters, too. So we're going to start a program where we're right on schedule. And uh, what we thought what we would do today is, uh, I'm gonna get my notes here if you don't mind. We thought what we did do today, because you know, most of our, most of our shows um, in the past years have featured national and um, international presenters, multicultural. So we thought this year, we'll move it around a little bit, and we want to bring you presenters that are, live right here in the cities. I think that's important to know that. Um, when you're looking at uh, your, your outreach efforts, you know that you have some collaborators right here in the cities. And uh, I think that we've, uh, we've kind of neglected doing that in the past. So this year we're gonna be pretty much featuring a lineup of presenters that are right here. And they, they, they know the community, they can feel it. They know what works and, and what doesn't work. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. What's working? Uh, you'll hear some, some interesting stories on outreach and what they're doing, because we're all here to learn, right? We're all, how do we make it happen? And our, you know, our companies and our organizations, they want us to learn. They want you to come back and say, hey, you know, I think we learned today that there's some things we can do, that we can, we can uh, start our collaborations, and you know, on behalf of Aguilar Productions and all our people, that we're here to help as much as we can. So here's our first presenter. And, uh, it's, a, it's a, a person that I've gotten to know over the years, particularly since we started our, our paper, Latino American Today, because she's a, a regular collaborator with us. And she's a fabulous example of um, what's happening in the Latino community. The Latinas are the fastest growing business group in the country, <coughs> in the country. And they're also, for your information, they're also the decision makers. So if you're gonna start your marketing outreach, make sure you're hitting that mom at home or the, or the single Latina, because they're, they're the decision maker, folks. Every, we pointed that out, it's very real, and it's something we have to understand. If you, when you start your marketing, make sure you're aiming messaging to mom, because uh, that's really their role. Amalia Moreno Damgard is a chef entrepreneur from Guatemala and the author of Amalia's Guatemalan Kitchen with prior corporate background. She was the founder of Amalia LLC, a nationally certified woman-owned consultancy, and of Women's Entrepreneurs of Minnesota, a 501c6 nonprofit fostering women entrepreneurship. An in-demand bilingual writer and speaker on wellness and healthier eating lifestyle and Latin culture, Amalia is a frequent guest on local TV and radioactive on three boards, including the American Diabetes Association of Minnesota. She partnered recently at the Super Bowl, teaching children healthy snacking and participating as a celebrity judge during the Super Snack Challenge. How many people participated in the Super Bowl this past gig? Did we, were you there, anybody? Oh, they left us out, they left the Minnesotans out. Yeah, of course, of course, man. That was never for us, was it? 
We were out in the cold on Hennepin, on the mall, on the Clay Mall. And, uh, but, you know, she's also one, she's an award winner. She's the, the 2017 Latino American Today Hispanic Heritage Award that we presented to Amalia, very well deserved. And she's a graduate of Le Cordon Bleu and the National Speakers Association of Minnesota with a master's in international business from St. Louis University. What more can we say? Amalia Moreno Damgard. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning to all. Thank you, Rick, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here today sharing a little bit of my story and a little bit more with all of you today. So I am happy that you took the time to come here today. It's springtime, but it's not really. It doesn't look like springtime. It doesn't yeah. feel like springtime. But yay, it's springtime. <laughs> it's on the record. So um, I wrote an article for Minnesota Business Magazine not too long ago entitled A Paradigm Shift of Multicultural Proportions. And I did this because everything that I do every day in my personal or professional life touches multiculturalism in one way or another. But I'm also very aware of what's going on in our country and also in Minnesota. <coughs> so my article was to basically talk about and create awareness about what's going on in the country in terms of multiculturalism as well as what's going on here in the Twin Cities. And also to give insights and some strategies to entrepreneurs, companies, and nonprofits about what to do about taking advantage of these opportunities that are opening up for just about everyone. So I am basing my presentation today on this article, and I am going to be going through some data, some numbers. I don't like to share a lot of numbers because to me numbers don't mean much <laughs> if there's not a story behind them. So I'm a storyteller, I'm a chef, um, and I, I have a corporate background, so I combine those two. And I say, when I was a banker, one of the most boring things was for me to listen to someone give a presentation sharing a lot of numbers, because they may not stick with you as much as the story behind them. It's important to know them, but it's more important to understand the big picture. So if we move to the next sl slide, Rico, I'm gonna just go like this if you don't mind. Sure. I love learning curves. We're all familiar with them because they apply to business, but they also apply to our personal lives and also to our professional lives. The pictures here on the screen are the highlights of my professional, personal and professional career, beginning from uh, the your left to my right, to the right, is also the chronology of my journey here in the US. So at the top, my right, it's me that places me in Guatemala City. It looks like I am playing hard to get. Right? <laughs> but that's not the case. So here I am at the uh, home of my parents in Guatemala City. And then my parents tell me that this is a picture taken by a real estate company who was going around the neighborhood taking pictures. And I happened to be out there playing with my friend and play pal Paco. Paco is a nickname for Francisco uh, in Latin America. So here I am. In the middle, I am in my kitchen in Eden Prairie. Places me uh, now in the US with my son, then 14, now 19. He's my pride and joy. He goes to Washington University, all in School of Business in St. Louis. And this is a photo shoot for a feature article on a magazine. And then on the left, uh, the two logos that you see there, uh, the top logo is for the two businesses I founded and now run. Uh, nonprofit Women Entrepreneurs of Minnesota, and then Amalia, Latin Gourmet with a Cultural Play. And there's one picture there that is hidden underneath. 
uh, the, all the food there that you see and right below my son. And that is my other baby. I call my first book my, my second baby because that's what it is. A book is a creation from within. It's your voice. It's everything that you have wished and, and, and hoped for to say or to tell in a book. It is also one of the scariest things that I have done because a book opens you up for good and bad criticism. You don't know how it's going to be received and so on. It is also one of the most challenging things that I have done because I am a native speaker, well, a Spanish native speaker, and my book is entirely in English. So I am working on the second one. My book has been very well received, it has won nine awards, and it has been a bestseller from day one. Whoa. You don't know what's going to happen with a book. So now I'm inspired and I am writing my second one. So talking about learning curves, I connect those to my journey as well. As an immigrant, I was born and raised in Guatemala City and I came with a culture and a mentality that I acquired while living in Guatemala. When I moved to the U.S., um, I had to learn a new culture. I come from a collectivist <coughs> culture into an individualist culture. Collectivist is a weak society, meaning that decisions, basically everything in terms of family and business, take uh, part as, as, the group, as, a group, as a group or as the family, if it's a personal situation. As a weak society, we do a lot of things in groups and we make decisions in groups we go to places in groups and so on. Why is this important? This is important for marketing, so that you know, for you to know that. Um, the mentality is a big thing, because when we come to the US, then we acquire a, another culture, and I will talk more about, a little bit more about that. So another learning curve in my professional life and uh, my personal life is becoming a mother. One of the best things that can happen to any, any woman and any parent <coughs> comes with these challenges, learning curves, there is the big responsibility of raising a child in any country in the world. <coughs> Technology, terrorism, concerns of safety and so on. But also the opportunity to be a mentor, a leader, nurturing this child life by leading by good, good example. Mm -hmm. And also by instilling good examples such as, you know, uh, in, in my case it's important, uh, spirituality is very important to me most uh, Latin Americans are uh, Catholic by trade. So I instilled those values in my son as well. Another learning curve is when I founded my two businesses. This comes with instructions, but you have to plan. There's skill required. There's a lot of grit. Lots of mentors are needed in between and, and so on. Then, as a founder or as, a, as, a, as an author, it has a different set of challenges. It's a new learning curve in terms of the literary world. It's a very complex world in terms of it's changing. It used to be traditional. <coughs> you would go to an agent. Not so anymore. Now it's digital. and. There's so many self-publishing opportunities and so on. You have no idea how it's going to do in terms of sales and so on. We can move to the next slide, please. Why am I sharing all these stories with you? For me, it's really, really important to understand myself, where I come from, where I am, to be able to understand the big picture, the, the world that we live in, and also the country that we live in, but most importantly, I live here in the state of Minnesota. So this gives me a background and a frame of mind uh, to better understand where, where we are. I'd like to share some insights that I also call forces that I have identified to better understand the culture that we are operating in the US and in Minnesota. I spoke a little bit about culture earlier, connected to my childhood and my upbringing. Um, but culture and versus mentality are, are deeply ingrained in the head of every immigrant. 
and in the head of every American, because this doesn't apply just to um, immigrants. When we are born with a culture, we develop the mentality based on that culture. And that comes from a collectivist culture, where I come from entrepreneurship, for example, is not systemic, it's not supported, because it's not never been part of that. I come of a, from an even heavier male-dominated society into entrepreneurship, an individualistic <coughs> society that supports women entrepreneurship and so on. I'm gonna jump to acculturation levels. Acculturation refers to culture again. And when we are encultured into one, um, in, into a culture, we are born with that culture. So we acquire the culture that we're born in, right? And we develop a mentality according to that. Then when we become acculturated, when you either move from one country to the next, or when this applies to companies as well, because there's culture everywhere, right? But in this regard, it refers to demographic. When you become acculturated, <coughs> acculturated means it's the blending of the cultures. Your original culture that you were born with and the one that you are acquiring. And this is a long-term process because it involves learning traditions, customs, learning about food, and so on. It can take a lifetime. For me, it's taken a long, long time, including the language. You know, I've been here for a long time, and I think that I speak the language to understand, to, to communicate, but I feel that I still need to learn a lot more. So going back to demographics here, I don't like to talk about numbers. I said that earlier. But I like to connect some numbers just so that they make a little sense here of what I'm talking about, because all this is connected. Demographic shifts are a big part of what we are experiencing right now. Think of demographics as a big, big puzzle because you cannot look at a number in an isolated way because they are all connected to one another. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, <coughs> it is projected that by the year 2065, the face of America will look totally different of what it is today. We are progressing to a minority, majority country. Today, numbers from 2015-16, the total, total population of the U.S. is 324 million, projected to grow in 2065 to, two, to, to 441 million, for example. Whites today, Caucasians, are 62% of the population, and they're the majority. In 2065, they're projected to be 46%. They're still going to be the large number of minorities, but no longer the majority. Hispanics now are 18%, this is 2015, 16 numbers, projected to grow at 24 to 24% of the total population in 2065. Asians, now 6%, then 14%. African Americans, now 12%, then 13%. What's behind these numbers? You know, there's purchasing power attached to them, um, there's culture attached to them, there's marketing insights attached to them, but there's also trends attached to them in terms of who is the fastest growing group right now? It has been Hispanics, but no longer. Now it's Asians. Asians are going to, at some point, surpass, surpass Latinos. And this is as a result of a couple of things. Immigration, but also <laughs> the immigrants that are already here tend to have more children than Americans, than whites at the rate sometimes <coughs> of two versus 1.5. Baby boomers is another 
interesting demographic point to look at. And this is what's contributing to what we call the graying of America. It's also what, what is contributing uh, to the changing face of America. And the reason, one of the reasons why we're progressing to a, ma a minority majority country, because baby boomers, for the longest part, are the largest group within with the largest group within um, the Caucasians. And they're aging, they're dying, and they're not being replaced. And by replaced, I mean that replacement can take place in terms of immigration. So there is immigration <coughs> taking place, but the people that are coming are much, much younger, not necessarily older. So they're not contributing to that age group. So the largest group now is the millennials. And the millennials are an interesting group of people that stand totally alone in terms of all the generations that have existed in the US. They behave differently, they don't adopt, uh, they, they don't adopt the customs and traditions that we have normally adopted as a group. There's also different trends going on in terms of uh, global, global trends. Um, there's a list of 10 trends that I study, um, and I picked two because we don't have time to go all, over them. Millennials is one of them. It's the largest living group of, uh, of youngsters, anywhere 18 from, from 18 years old or 20 years old to 35 years old. Um, and also another interesting trend connected to multiculturalism is that Americans' lives are changing <coughs> dr drastically. Uh, as a result of immigration, uh, marriage is not traditionally what it used to be. Uh, people are not getting married uh, traditionally the way they used to be. There is more interracial, interracial marriages. There is all, also different kinds of marriages taking place. And there is no marriage at all in some instances. People are living together. Millennials are, some of millennials are moving with their parents. And the collective, individualistic societies are merging together. Families are interracial. This is creating a growing need for all of us to pay attention to these trends <laughs> because this is creating opportunities as well. So some opportunities for us, when you connect all this information, there is a lot more to know, but we don't have time uh, to go well over all the numbers. So I want to give you some um, quick strategies that companies, nonprofits, and entrepreneurs can pursue, can look into, and investigate. If you're not part of this growing trend, demographic trend, you gotta do something about it because we are already here. We have been here for a long time. The demographic trend started a long time ago. It's just that now it's picking up speed even faster. So some of the insights to gain intelligence, and this is not just for the Latino uh, market. It, this applies to the Asian market, it applies to <coughs> any market. And I want to say that this is a reversible um, strategy, quick strategy situation, because we Latinos need to immerse ourselves more into American opportunities, into American uh, networking situations, and so on. And I'll say that the, 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 re the reverse is true as well for Americans. Make a deliberate attempt to get familiar with the market that you are trying to tap into, whether it's Hispanic, whether it's Asian, and so on. One of the ways that companies can do this is to add more diversity to management and to their boards of directors. Look at your current makeup of <coughs> management. Is it diverse enough? Look for specific talent in international organizations. If you're looking to hire Asians, African Americans, Latinos, and so on. There are so many different organizations here between cities, Global Minnesota, and others, where you can go and 
immerse yourself and look for some of this talent as well. Take a course, crash course on cultural competence. Uh, there are many places offering cultural competences, courses connected to business. This is good for you, this is good for your company, and this is good overall for everyone. <coughs> you can try to integrate bilingual multicultural systems into your website, into your uh, organization, and build it from the top down, um, incorporate it into a strategic plan, for example. You can hire consultants with big visions, who have international experience, who have global experience as well, to help you get there. Tap into the insights of executives that you may have in your corporations right now who travel globally. They know a lot. For nonprofits, establish a multilingual presence online. A multicultural, multicultural advisory board. I belong to one of them at the American Diabetes Association because it's important for us to be able to reach a multicultural audience. And what a better way to do it than through a multicultural, multicultural advisory board? I'm gonna go on to the last. <coughs> international organizations. Establish a multi, multilingual presence online, <coughs> acquire mentors, and so on. The list goes on and on and on. Diversity is not, is, is not a business goal. It's a necessity, it's a priority. We are here to develop business in Minnesota, we're here to develop business in the US, and we are interconnected to a big world. We are progressing to a minority, a minority majority country. We're here to embrace the trends, and if we don't embrace them, there we go from relevant to irrelevant. So I'd like to turn it over to you and ask you, what opportunities are you taking advantage of? What opportunities are you missing out on? <coughs> because you haven't fully embraced this multicultural environment that we are all living in. We're here today. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. And that's the beginning. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, Amaya. You know, I, was, I was wondering now, you, uh, you just spoke at this women's uh, event, right? A mar was it a marketing event? But women professionals, I would say? Yes. And that was a, a group of what, 300? Could you give us a little idea what was that, that yes, was that about? Yes, this was a first of its kind uh, event put together by ACG and two other uh, major organizations here in the Twin Cities. And it was a leadership conference. As you know, women entrepreneurship is taking, it's taking over and it's <laughs> going to continue to, to be uh, a force here as well, in addition to multiculturalism. And uh, our first conference was attended by 300 women in the Twin Cities at the Millennium Hotel. And this just talks about what's going on here locally. And you know, this is an a global um, phenomenon going on, and it's a good one. And this is going to happen every year. So the name of the conference is AIM Flourish Women's Leadership Conference. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I have a question. Now, I mean, what advice or thoughts do you have about forming a multicultural uh, board, advisory board? If you've done that before, just how do you go about doing it, and who's doing the um, food? I, I have that challenge on my lap right now because I run a nonprofit, 501c6, and I uh, formed a nonprofit board uh, back in 2007. 
2007 was the beginning of women's entrepreneurship. It was really visible back then. But I saw a necessity to form a group because as a business woman, I did not get the support then that I was, that I was needing from banks and so on. So in approaching building this nonprofit board, you know, we sit with our, our board of directors and we brainstorm what do we need in terms of talent, what do we need in terms of skill, and what do we need in terms of demographics. Then we just go and present our findings during our speaking events, during our peer advisory events, and then we invite other women from various backgrounds. We are very deliberate about it. You have to be deliberate about it and say we are looking for this specific talent. You can also contact um, Global Minnesota and see if they can help you there. They have <coughs> a lot of, they have a very diverse uh, membership base. It's international and global in nature, but there are many resources in the Twin Cities. I'll be ha happy to help you. Aside, I don't want to take a long time and allow for other questions, but I, I'll, be, I'll be glad to give you more information. Thank you. Yeah, I was curious, so you mentioned the importance of having a multilingual presence online. I'm curious to hear kind of what recommendations you have as far as how to implement that and make our websites more accessible and more multilingual and kind of even going beyond that, like when people come to our businesses or call our businesses, how we can make sure that we're being welcoming and accessible to everyone. Yeah, you know, I have struggled at times finding talent here in the Twin Cities that understands both sides, right? I am fortunate that I feel that I have a foot in the American side and a foot in the Latino side. But when it comes down to merging the two into one platform, you have to find someone that understands that. Um, you may have to go to Chicago, you may have to go to Miami, or you may have to tap into forces, other, other resources that truly understand you know, how to convert you cannot translate certain things, literally. Um, you have to be able to interpret <coughs> the, the cultures, not necessarily translate. Translating is one thing, interpreting is another thing. And so I would advise you to look into a company that has the multilingual capabilities, look at the reputation, <coughs> you know, how many websites they're built and so on. Good, good, Thank good you. Questions. Good questions. Judy, I, I just was curious about your second baby yes. and what that book is about. My second book, when I created the first one, when you write a book, it's hard to stop because you're, you're sleeping, you wake up at 2, 3 o'clock in, in the morning sometimes, and your brain starts going, right? Oof, light bulb. I got to include this idea in my book. So I went through that towards the end, so I had to stop at some point. So I, I felt that I still had enough, a lot of information that I wanted to get out of my head. So I took a lot of notes. So my, my second book is going to be centered on Guatemala again, but I am expanding it to a bigger region, Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica is an area that encompasses part of Mexico and it goes all the way down through Central America and parts of Costa Rica. What's really, really cool here, important to know, is that this is a cultural, cultural and agricultural hub uh, that connects us all. There are commonalities, but there are also nuances and very, very visible differences. So I'm big on food and culture. So that's my next book, Mesoamerica. Coming to Amazon or a store near you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got your cookbook at home. I haven't, I haven't used it yet. Um, but I run out of my frozen dinners out. I'm going to try to do it. Well, that's a wonderful presentation. I, I'm glad we had that response because, this, again, we're trying to feature some of our, our talent here in the cities. 
And um, I was particularly interested in that in, in the in the uh, use of uh, uh, either a website or being able to have a uh, uh, a bilingual uh, call center, if you will, working with you. And I uh, was just very fortunate to have one of the leaders in the industry, Rico Vallejos, here. But he'll maybe go into that. But that's a good topic for another conference, Rico. 